Hi guys, it's Nurse Celine from Go Nursing RN. In this video, we're gonna be discussing hypovolemia and hypervolemia. We will be covering the background, clinical manifestations, diagnostics, treatment, and interventions for both of them. So let's begin. When patients are in hypovolemia, we can figure out what that means by simply breaking down the term. Hypo means low and volemia means volume. This can be known also as dehydration, fluid volume deficit, or depletion. Patients who have hypovolemia have a lack of fluids in the body. So all of our vital organs are going to be depleted from fluids that carry a lot of electrolytes, nutrition, and oxygen. Causes of hypovolemia has to do with situations that lead the patients to lose fluids. That can be due to various reasons, some which include GI loss from vomiting or diarrhea, NG tube. So for example, if a patient has an NG tube, we can connect the NG tube to suction and decompress the stomach, which can also lead the patient into hypovolemia. Hemorrhage and massive blood and plasma loss, trauma, various procedures such as paracentesis, which can be done for someone who has liver cirrhosis, or even a thoracentesis to help someone who possibly has pleural fusions. Those that have increased urination, which means that they have polyuria due to diabetes or diabetes insipidus. When patients are on diuretics, which are medications to help lose volume and increase their urine output. Third spacing is another cause of hypovolemia. Let's review what third spacing is first. It will be the movement of fluid from the intravascular space to the interstitial space. This will cause the patient to have a drop in circulating volume because it is no longer in the vessels. This can happen when patients have developed liver disease and cirrhosis. With that, they can then start building up ascites, which is going to be the accumulation of fluid in their abdominal peritoneal cavity. Third spacing can also happen for patients who have burns. They will have edema, which can at times be pretty extensive. So they might have more of a marked weight gain or just look swollen overall. They're going to have low albumin levels, which is a type of protein. So those are patients we wanna definitely assess their abdominal pressures, their abdominal girth, and possibly might need some surgery or even a paracentesis due to the ascites. Some signs and symptoms of hypovolemia include decreased blood pressure. These patients are going to have significant hypotension due to the decreased volume in the vessels that will decrease the pressure and overall decrease cardiac output. With that being said, the heart is going to try to compensate for that low blood pressure and work harder. So there's going to be an increased heart rate and kind of lead to a weak, thready pulse. There will be a decreased central venous pressure, also known as CVP. Now, CVP measures the amount of preload in that right atrium. Due to having low fluid volume, a lot of times these patients are going to have less amount of fluid in that right atrium, which leads to low central venous pressures. Respiratory clinical manifestations with hypovolemia include increased respirations, also known as tachypnea, which will help the body try to compensate due to having low amount of fluids. That can then also lead to hypoxia. Renal is going to be decreased urine output due to the kidneys not having enough fluids to push out, or a lot of times when the kidneys see that the body's in distress, it's gonna try to hold back onto that fluid, and these patients are gonna have low urine output. In regards to skin, these patients are gonna have decreased skin turgor. When we look at the skin turgor, we're going to pull up a lot of times the skin on that hand to see if there's tinting of the skin. If there is tinting of the skin, then that means that they are dehydrated. If you look right here, if you look at my hand and I pinch it, looking for my skin turgor, you see that my skin recoils. So I am hydrated. The patients are also going to have decreased capillary refill, right? Because of that dehydration. They also will have cool, clammy skin, flat neck veins. That's where we're going to look at the sides of their necks to see how distended or flat their neck veins may be and dry mucous membranes. Labs that you will see in hypovolemia is you wanna think that everything is actually gonna go up because it's gonna be more concentrated increased hematocrit, 
increased BUN, increased urine specific gravity, increased blood sodium, and increased blood osmolarity. So our treatment plan is going to be key. We want to replace those fluids, whether it's PO or IV. We want to monitor their eyes and nose and make sure that we don't throw the patient into fluid overload, right? We don't want to reverse this whole thing and make a whole nother issue on the opposite end. So we continue on to ensure that we're checking their vital signs, checking that blood pressure, and also patients who are hypovolemic are going to be at risk for orthostatic hypotension. So we don't want them getting up really quickly. We want them to ensure they are taking their time when they're getting out of bed. Most important thing is educate them on using that call light, right? So that way we can safely get them up. Another thing is that we want to take daily weights. Daily weights is going to give us an idea to see how their fluid replacement process is going. A key thing with daily weights is you want to make sure you're taking the patient's weight at the same time, using the same scale, with the same clothing each day in order to get the most accurate weight. We also want to monitor the patient's IV hydration status in regards of how much we're giving the patient, but also when we discharge them at home to ensure that we educate them on adequately staying hydrated. Now we're going to go over hypervolemia. Breaking it down, we have hyper, which means high, and volemia means volume. So the patient will have high volume of fluids that's in that intravascular space, which then can lead to the patients to have fluid overload. One common cause is going to be heart failure. The heart is not able to effectively pump out blood out of the aorta, which leads the backup of fluid into the actual body. Another common reason is kidney injury. When the kidneys are not functioning adequately, this can cause backup of fluids and not be able to excrete the excessive fluids in the body. Cirrhosis is another reason. Fluid shifting due to burns, because during burns we're going to give a lot of fluids, so because of that they can go into hypervolemia. And increased sodium intake, because remember, where sodium goes, water follows. So the more sodium we have, the more retention of fluids we're going to have in the body as well. Some signs and symptoms of hypervolemia include increase in weight. Specifically, it's going to be a lot of water weight. Also, cardiovascularly, they're going to have increased heart rate, tachycardia. But the difference between hypo and hypervolemia tachycardia is that they're going to have more of a bounding pulse with patients that are hypervolemic. Remember, hypovolemic, it's going to be more of a weak, thready pulse, right? Central venous pressures in hypervolemic patients are going to be increased because they're going to have more fluid that's being backed up into that heart and into the body. Respiratory wise, there's going to be increased fluids that are going to back up into the lungs that are going to lead to more crackles and dyspnea that the patient may start to have. We want to make sure we get chest x-rays of our patient's chest to make sure if they have developed any pulmonary congestion. One serious effect can be pulmonary edema which means that there's severe fluid overload in the lungs and the patients are going to have major amount of dyspnea and possible altered level of consciousness, pink tinged sputum, and it can be really serious and it can lead to possible mechanical ventilation. GI wise, they can have ascites, liver enlargement, and increased motility within that GI system, so possibly some diarrhea. Other signs include, big one as well, peripheral edema. We want to assess to see is it a pitting edema, non-pitting edema, and we also have different values, plus one, plus two, plus three, or plus four. We also are going to have increased urine output, distended neck veins, so we're going to assess those neck veins, and a lot of times they're going to be distended with your hypervolemic patients. Now let's review lab. A trick to think is that everything is going to go down because we are going to be more diluted. So that's going to cause hematocrit hemoglobin to be decreased, blood osmolarity to be decreased, urine sodium to be decreased, and BUN also to be decreased along with decreased urine specific gravity as well. 
So the more fluid we have, the more dilute, so everything is going to go down. Treatment plan include monitoring their eyes and nose. What are we giving them and what kind of output are we getting? At the end of the day, we want to diurese our patient as much as possible, so a lot of times they're going to be on a diuretic medication. We want to weigh our patients daily and document the trends. Are they gaining weight or losing weight? Assess breath sounds and also assess for a peripheral edema. Is it getting worse? or better. We want to ensure that our patients are on a sodium modified diet and we want to encourage them to look at their nutrition, look at what they're eating and try to see how much sodium is in the products that they're buying outside of the hospital, say that when they get discharged. We also want them to ensure that they let the physician know when they start gaining weight to ensure to see if they need to increase their medications for any scenario. A couple medications, as mentioned, diuretics can include like loop diuretics or even potassium spraying diuretics that will help diurese the patient. Those are going to have side effects, so we do want to make sure that they're educated about those as well. So big, big takeaway here is to understand that volume status in your patient is extremely important. You are going to see hyper and hypervolemia day to day in the hospital. For example, in the ICU, a lot of times patients are extremely septic or have a major infection they're going to be extremely hypovolemic because they're ex extremely vasodilated. So with these patients, we need to encourage a lot of fluid intake. Now, on the other hand, you're also going to get patients that are unfortunately in severe cardiovascular disease phases of cardiomyopathy, so their heart is not pumping very well and they don't have a good ejection fraction. So with those kind of patients, we're thinking that they're going to have fluid overload. They're going to have a buildup of fluid. So we really want to ensure that we're assessing their lung sounds, assessing their cardiovascular status, and intervening with medications, a lot of times like mentioned, diuretics, and trying to see what kind of plan of care we can ensure that the patient is aware of and educated about. Thank you for making it this far in my video. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe here below. Also, if you have any specific nursing topics you would like me to make a video about, please feel free to share them in the comment section as well. See you all next time!